Hey Dale, thanks a lot for joining us today. We are here to talk about 2019 Accelerate State of the DevOps report. Why don't you talk about what your role at Vendasta is and what Vendasta really does as a company? I'm the CTO at Vendasta, so my job really encompasses supporting our research and development organization, which is 17 teams. What Vendasta does is we provide a platform for selling products and solutions to local businesses. So uh, there's over 2 million local businesses that are in our platform. They're using some form of software today. There are over 10,000 partners of ours that are selling solutions based on our technology every day and millions of businesses that rely on it. Could you talk more about what that report is? Yeah, no, it's pretty exciting. I think there's something like 31,000 respondents and I think six years worth of data. So it's actually got a lot of interesting insights you can pull when you start to get a report this big. And uh, you know, we found a lot of great stuff in there. Why did you decide on using the guidance which the report provides? We had already started a transition into SRE and we'd actually built an SRE team at Vendasta before the, we had read the material from Accelerate the State of DevOps. Starting with the SRE material, we had begun to measure deployment frequency and we had begun to measure mean time to resolution. So from the Accelerate uh, the State of DevOps, we came out with the other two metrics that were really valuable. And the first one was lead time, which talks about how long is it from when you first commit code until that code is on production. And so this was a kind of the critical second step was rather than doing big batches quickly, we ended up doing much smaller batches. And as part of that, that change fail percentage. So not only how quickly can you recover, but how often do you need to? Based upon Accelerate State of the DevOps report, you looked at four matrices, which help with speed and stability. Are there specific learnings from this process which you can share with us? As with a lot of these things, it, it completely starts with uh, you know, measurement and self-assessment because it's pretty hard to know where you need to improve if you don't really know where you stand. I think there's an online tool available that uh, is part of the Accelerate State of the DevOps that you can do a self-assessment on where you stand on your current metrics and it'll help you understand what that piece that you need to focus on is because rather than trying to do all four, it's an understanding of which parts of your practice you should start to work on, aka your biggest constraint. So where did you actually start? Yeah, so for us, looking at our organization, we said that one of the biggest problems for us was continuous integration. And uh, for a company that all of our software was in the cloud, we had this one wart, which was our continuous integration server was actually on-prem. We started with having this naive approach of like, let's take what we currently have and let's move that into the cloud. And so that's where we took and uh, we evaluated actually taking Team City. And, and moving that into the cloud. But for a variety of reasons, what we ended up doing was moving to Jenkins, which is a very similar CI system. And we moved into Kubernetes on Google Cloud. With Jenkins in the cloud, we could actually provision more VMs as we grew and things like that. But if we were running our CI infrastructure on the same Kubernetes cluster that we are running our production infrastructure on. And so, as scaling happens, we actually would have production workloads impacted by our Jenkins. That's not the case in the world of cloud build. The use of cloud uh, for continuous integration, specifically cloud build, were you something really surprised by? Yeah, when we stopped having static virtual machine definitions and the teams could define their resource requirements per build, we actually found an 80% reduction in some of our projects in the total time to run the build. We've actually seen the number of deploys across our organization increase by 30%. So that means 30% more deploys every day by each developer than we had before. And that's a pretty big change considering that's just a change to CI. In your case, the biggest constraint was continuous integration. How have you expanded the CI process into other areas to improve the speed and the velocity with which you're delivering software to your customers? I think there's a couple parts to this. Looking throughout your process and end-to-end -end finding opportunities for automating. So CI CD is obviously one of those, but there's lots of parts of your organization where you can find opportunities to automate. And then I think one of the other things that we talk about as like a core concept of this is going to be that shift left. If you think about security at the beginning, it's a lot easier and less costly to deal with it at the beginning than it is to find a solution that's insecure and then try and make it secure. The last one is obviously probably the most important, which is that culture which is getting people to buy into some of the changes you're doing and that this is a positive change for them. And so rather than feeling like a mandate. Could you talk more about end-to-end -end automation? Yeah. 
So f for our process, what we're doing is on each commit, which is hitting GitHub, that's triggering one of our cloud builds. And so cloud build is then going ahead and running on that code and producing artifacts. And so those artifacts are then, you know, we're running as part of that, we're running lints, we're running tests, we're running other things. And when an artifact actually passes all of those tests, then it goes ahead into container registry. And this is where vulnerability scanning happens to check for problems with like the underlying images or, or things like that, known, known vulnerabilities. And then what we're using is, is before it gets deployed, we're using binary authorization to say like, is this actually something from the correct repository that we're going to deploy on your production infrastructure? And then controlling what uh, accounts have access to do that kind of deployment. And then that's where we've controlled across the whole architecture now, infrastructure. We've got end-to-end -end automation from right from commit until deployment to the infrastructure. So that covers end-to-end -end automation. That covers shifting left. Let's go to the third part, which is implementing cultural change. Well, the way it starts is getting the business side of the organization, the product side of the organization to buy into the concept of availability that is not 100%. It's prohibitively expensive the closer you get to a true 100%. I think that the, the metrics are when you go from 99% availability to a 99.9% .9 availability, it's, it's an exponential increase in cost for every nine you want to add. And the question becomes, is that worth it to your customers? And also, do your underlying systems actually also offer that? Because if you improve the availability of your system, but not the underlying ones, it might be that you're spending money on availability that actually your customers can't see because, you know, essentially you're not the, the longest pole in the tent. Can we pivot and talk about your journey to cloud and what guidance you can give to organizations specifically who are in the process of moving to the cloud? Maybe thinking about the cloud as not a step or uh, you know, a discrete quanta that way, it, it's going to be a process that takes a long time. I like Nicole Forsgren's picture of, you know, it's like a gym membership. It's not like you buy it and you're done. If getting cloud is like a gym membership, what are the different activities you can do in order to realize the potential of cloud fully? So, you know, if you ask companies, uh, as the Dora report does, there's, uh, you know, are you using cloud? The answer is of course, <laughs> everybody's using cloud. And so when we use the NIST definition of cloud, um, of which there's five components, only 29% of respondents are actually using all five of those components of the cloud. The first capability we're talking about is on demand. So this means you can provision the capacity yourself. You don't have to phone somebody. The second one is broad network access, which means that you know it's not behind a VPN, only accessible from certain computers. This means it's accessible worldwide. The third one is resource pooling, which means there's this multi-tenant platform that you have access to more resources. And the fourth one is rapid elasticity. And so this means that you're able to quickly spin things up uh, when you need capacity and quickly spin them down when you don't. And the last one is measured service. And so this is important that the cloud provider is actually able to measure what you're using and bill you only for what you use. Well, Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.